أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Some of the masail which we have discussed quite often and we have explained quite frequently yet it pains us sometimes that we have got to repeat those things <coughs> especially because on that masala the whole namaz is dependent and that is the masala of wudu so many times when i stand there and i do wudu together with the mu'minin i find that the wudu the way it is being done is incorrect and we have got to sometimes tell them hoping that they will understand and they will follow but there can be occasions when we are not there and the wudu is being performed incorrectly and when wudu is incorrect therefore namaz is also incorrect because it is from the conditions and prerequisites of namaz that is one aspect of it second is of course that we have a method of wudu in which we follow the school of ahlul bayt sallallahu alaihi wasallam when ibn abbas one of the companions of the prophet performed wudu the way we do one of the contemporaries standing there who had a habit of doing wudu other way he said ibn abbas is this the way you do wudu i mean the way we do is he did the same thing that means he washed his face and he washed his hands and he wiped his head and wiped his feet and the man said is it the way how you do wudu and he said wallahi i saw the prophet do this way and no other way this way and no other way quran says waghsilu wujuhakum wa aydiyakum ila al marafiq wa msahu bi ru'usikum wa arjulikum wash your faces when you do wudu and your hands up to the elbow and wipe your heads and wipe your feet this is wudu and therefore it is very simple if i tell my son or my brother here that when you go to the bathroom see that you wash yourself up to the head he will not stand head balance up to does not mean going this way around up to means including and when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said ila al marafiq he meant that the mirfaq or rather the elbow must be included he did not mean to wash it this way you see is something very sensible it has got to be washed and that has got to be included and quran majid uses the word ila in other surah meaning with for example when he talks about the wealth of the trustees who have the wealth of orphans at their disposal he says wala ta'kulu amwalahum ila amwalikum and don't eat away their wealth together with yours there also he uses the word ila which does not mean up to it means with is don't mix it up now i say this thinking that inshallah my young brothers and sisters will see the elders will have to pardon me because this might be a repetition but this is important there was a time and this is no exaggeration when i was here for the first time years and years ago i have seen some people go to toilet and straight away join namaz 
Of course, not in this Imam Bada, elsewhere. And that also in the first row. Well, those days are past, alhamdulillah, and may those days never come again. But yet, there are certain things which we tell repeatedly. For example, I say repeatedly that in namaz jamaat please do not go to ruku and sajda before the imam has gone. How often have I said? But many of you feel that the imam does not see what is happening behind. True, he does not see. But he feels sideways, if not behind. It is only the Prophet who used to say, Sallu kama ra'aytu muni usalli, pray the way you see me pray, and do not go to sajda or ruku before I have gone, because I can see behind the way I see in front. It's only the Prophet who can say, I cannot say that. <coughs> but sideways we feel, sideways. After all, we are human beings. And the field of vision is such of every human person, if it is still safe. Uh, that you can see the people rushing to sajda before the imam has gone and rushing to ruku before imam has gone this is not jama'ah my friends similarly we have to say this again and again that when you wash we have got to wash our faces and please pour the water from here and not from the nose from where the hair grows Men or women, no difference. We just take the take water and pour it from here. So, and then with your hand, you can reach it thoroughly. If one pours here on the nose bridge and then pulls the water upwards, that is not wudu, my friends. It has got to start from here. And of course, the width of your palm, a normal palm, is enough. To take the sideburns together is mustahab. That is one thing. The idea is that water must reach everywhere. And if one has luxurious beard, then it is not necessary to, to put your fingers into the beard. <laughs> The outward is enough, <coughs> right? And then when you wash your hand, my friends, how often have I told my young brothers that please don't wash your hand from here. They pour water like this. It has got to start from above your elbow <coughs> so that you are sure that elbow has been included. This is for men. For women, it is mustahab that they turn their hand this way. But it must be parallel to the elbow. And they pour water from just above the line of elbow, but from inside. And then, of course, with their hands, they wipe and they see that water reaches everywhere. If there is a ring or a band, you can always see that water is reached everywhere. And this is how right hand. Similarly, left from top, from here, not from here. And when you do Masa, my friends, the only part of Masa is the one-fourth frontal quarter of the head. And that's all. This is the area of Masa. Not here. If you have parted your hair from here and you find it very convenient, That is not correct, my friends. This is the only part of Masa, that's all, the quarter frontal part of the head, skull. Either with a finger, two or three. <coughs> and it is not necessary to see that water reaches the skull, and that is why it is not necessary to strike like this. <laughs> it's to wipe. <coughs> and also for the feet, it is from the toes up to the joint or ankle, 
this way. Very simple. If you take all the toes together, small and big, that is mustahab. But wajib is only the big toe to your ka'bain. Wamsahu biru'usikum wa arjulikum ilal ka'bain. This is ka'bain. First right and then left, not two together. And because this is the age of escalators, where instead of you climbing the staircase, you f the staircase takes you up. Therefore, many people have devised a new method. They keep their hand here and they move it. <laughs> so, what is happening is that it is not the hand which moves, but the head moves. Similarly, when they keep their palm here or hand here, they do this. Now, that is a new philosophy because this is what you see in big stores that you don't climb the stair taxi. But here, it is wajib, my friend, that in wudu, the mover is the hand and not the head. Therefore, the mover must move in both sides. I hope, inshallah ta'ala, our wudu, inshallah, will be correct. And depending upon this wudu is our namaz. It's very simple. And now, <coughs> When you see someone do something incorrectly, please tell him. Yesterday I was talking about Rahma, one of the causes and reasons of mercy of Allah to reign and rule over us is Rahimallahum Ra'an Ida Samia Hukman Wa'a Wa Ida Duya Ila Rushdin Dana. May Allah have mercy upon the slave, that means we all of us, of Allah, who, when they are told what is the hukum of God, they listen. And when they are called unto the guidance, they come near, they don't run away. Well, if someone tells me there that, look, brother, your wudu is not sahih, please don't get disturbed, don't get angry. Thank him for having shown you the way. Of course, the one who shows the way has also got to do it politely. I mean, not insult. Politely, that my friend, this is how it is. And we have heard this quite often, because we are talking for our children also. We know this, that Imam Hassan and Imam Hussain, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhima. In their very young age, when they saw an elderly person in the most performing wudu incorrectly, there was a problem. They had to tell him, at the same time they felt he was an old man, they could not insult him, and they also felt that this man might be embarrassed if we tell him that the wudu you do is not correct. So they contrived another way. They both went to the old man and said, Uncle, we two brothers have a dispute. He says my wudu is not correct, and I think his is not correct. Now we will both perform the wudu before you. And you be the judge to say whose wudu is correct. When both of them performed wudu, the old man said, My sons, you have opened my eyes because your wudu seems to be correct, mine is wrong. The way of telling is that you don't have to offend people by insulting. And the way of accepting is that you accept in a manner which is graceful. This is what Amr al -Maruf. A community or a society which leaves the habit of Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahyan al Munkar. There is no Rahma. Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In Nahjul Balagha says, when the community or a society of Muslims will feel that our dua is not heard, that means when istijaba will stop, that means when people will go on weeping and crying and imploring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the dua will not be heard, then you must know that that is the time when Amr bil Ma'roof has disappeared. And Amr bil Ma'roof is something very important. To tell the people to enjoin upon good and to forbid that which is evil. Why? Because the philosophy that runs today in this society and every society is that this is my personal life. The moment we speak something from Mimba, the second day there is a reaction. Then why do you speak about our personal lives? Now the question of personal life, where do we draw the line? 
Suppose there is someone who drinks, Ta'udhu Billah. That is his personal life. Huh? He boozes. He drinks. It is his personal life. We can't tell him because his personal life. What happens next? Gradually as he drinks, and as the Chinese said clearly that when the man drinks for the first time, when a man drinks wine for the first time, man drinks wine. When he drinks for the second time, wine drinks wine. When he drinks for the third time, wine drinks man. Huh? When he becomes a habitual drunkard, gradually the family starts crumbling. Children are ignored. Wife is ignored. There is unhappiness in the home. And the whole structure breaks. When it breaks, where will he go? Mullah Fidaus and Khaki. Why? Personal life. Now the Jamaat must intervene. But why Jamaat should intervene? Why the community? Why Ahlul Khair should intervene? Why the elders should come and interfere? It was personal. Because nothing in this world that I do and you do is personal if you ponder deeply. It has an effect. And the family are a member of a society, even if they belong to you. It is not your personal life. You have ruined the lives of others. This is where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave an example. And that example is in the books. And the example is such that it really makes sense. When somebody asked him about his personal life and all that, Amr bin Maruf, he said, look, there were some travelers traveling in a boat. This is what the Prophet said. They were traveling in a boat. Everyone had paid his fare. Huh? One man who had paid his fare sat at his place and started drilling a hole in the ship, in the boat. The others who were sitting there, they could see that he's drilling a hole. So they went to him and they said, friend, what are you doing? He said, mind your own business. This is personal. I have paid for it. I am not sitting here free. I am not a stowaway. Eh? And I will do whatever I like. I have paid for it. But they said, you will pay for it. It's okay. You have paid. It is your personal thing. But by, by drilling that hole, soon water will gush in. And you will drown together with the whole boat. This is exactly what the society is, my friend. Someone does something, we just keep quiet and say, let him do it. It is personal. From there, water will gush in and it will one day sink the whole society. It has got to be stopped. It has got to be stopped. And the one who speaks has got to be courageous enough to speak. Irrespective of whether people like it or don't like it, but has got to be spoken that this is not right. This is wrong. Is it not so? When we leave this habit, the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is withdrawn. And if we wish to have rahmah in this month of Ramadan, then we would have to enjoy. We start from our own home. My own sons and my daughters, if they do something wrong, I say it at home first. To my wife, they tell me if I have done something wrong. And similarly, I will go to our friends and from friends to society. But there must be, their courage must be there to speak up and not to worry about what next. It is for this reason, my friends, that some of the companions of our Aimma, they simulated madness. You have heard the name of Bahlul. Uh, Bahlul Diwana, Bahlul Diwana. But was he Diwana? And why he became a Diwana? Has anyone ever read in history as to why? What made him go mad? He was simulating madness. That means he was just acting as a man. He was mad, he was not. In one of the meetings with Imam Musa ibn Ja'far Before I say this, Sayyid Shahabuddin Marashi in his Ihqaqul Haqq has actually given the name of this alim and said this Bahlul was an alim who is equal to a modern Mujtahid. He was just a Muhaddith. Hmm? In those days, Mujtahideen were called Muhaddithin in some of the areas. He was a great Mujtahid. He was the companion of Aimma Salawatullah Salaam Ali Majmain. Huh? And when Imam Ali Salaam was in the prison, our seventh Imam, he happened to be there. He just stared at Imam and Imam looked at him and then Imam said, you will have to continue with the work of 
Amr bil ma'roof in the society. And he said, Yabna Rasulillah, times are difficult. Imam al Islam wrote for him, Jim, Jim, Jim. And that paper was passed over to him. He read Jim and he construed Jim as Junoon. Junoon means madness. And from that day onwards, he simulated madness. The whole world knew that there is something behind it, but he simulated so thoroughly that today many people say Bahlul Divan. Uh, a man who sat in the Qabrastan every day and one day someone says, Bahlul, why, uh, why are you sitting in the graveyard in cemetery? People are living in the cities, you, are, you live in the, in the cemetery, uh, something wrong, come, come. <laughs> and the answer he gave, he said, I really can't understand how mad you people are. People from the cities come here. <laughs> They leave their palaces, huh? their families. They finally come to rest here. I am resting here. You want me to come back? Come here. And when once Harun Rashid was entering the cemetery and Bahlul saw him, Bahlul took his stick and started measuring. And there were some skulls. See? He was just looking at those skulls. I mean, if you have been to those very old Qabristan, you can see those skulls. And Harun knew that Bahlul was not, not a divan. So he said, Bahlul, but what are you doing playing with this skull? He said, I'm just trying to see which one belongs to the king <laughs> and which one belongs to the ordinary man. It is enough. Amr bil ma'roof for the king to understand what Harun is, what Bahlul is saying. And then he, when he saw him measuring, I said, what are you measuring? He said, I'm not measuring anything. I'm just trying to tell you that it is one meter for king and one meter for a layman. It is the same. The final destination is not more than a meter. Harun wept. Harun wept. These are the things that move people. And in this manner, Aimma alayhi musalam commanded even in difficult days that Amr bil Maruf must continue. The famous thing is that once he was playing with sand, sand and making some castles out of sand and Zubaydah passed. Zubaydah is Bahlul's, uh, I mean Harun Rashid's wife, queen. And she also knew that this man is not a fool. And she said, Bahlul, what are you doing? He said, I'm making, uh, I, I'm, I'm constructing buildings in Jannah. Apparently a madman would say this. I'm making some buildings in Jannah. So Zubaydah made a joke after it. He said, are you selling them? He said, yes, I'm selling for 100,000 dirham. When he said that I'm selling Jannah for 100,000 dirham, Zubaydah gave 100,000 dirham. He said, I'm buying one for you. He said, all right. When he, she gave the money to him, Bahlul came to the town and distributed the money to the poor and said, let us have good time today. The money has after all come out of the coffers. Come on, have good time. He went on giving to the poor people. Somebody needed clothes, somebody needed food. It was an Eid day. At night when she related the story to Harun, Harun said, you women really have no sense. That fellow acts a fool. A castle which is being built on sand, and you say that you bought castle in Jannah. Well, Zubeda said, I did it. I know that that man is not a fool. At night when Harun slept, he saw that Qiyamah has set in. And he saw that there was a garden. And in garden there was a palace. And he just asked someone, to whom does this belong? And someone said, this belongs to Zubeda. She bought it today. He bought it from Bahlul today. The next day, Harun Rashid passed from the same place and saw Bahlul making the same castles. And he said, Bahlul, what are you doing? He said, I'm preparing this for Jannah. Jannah. Can I buy this? He said, we don't sell after viewing. Huh? <laughs> we don't sell after viewing. That was something else. She bought without having viewed. That means Bahlul was of that status that he knew what Harun had even dreamt. An alim of that stature. 
there comes a time when man has got to say, to speak. The moment we stop the practice of telling, this, these majalis and these vayanat um, <coughs> that I, I am presenting from first night to today is aimed at something which will come later. I'm trying to make it as brief so that it doesn't become very cumbersome. I'm trying to make it as light so that people don't get tired and don't sleep. But what I want to say is going to come later. Because if there is no one to tell us, no one to speak up, no one to tell us where we go wrong, then there is going to be no rahmah. There are going to be meetings. But what we are in need of is, is grace, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace. Something wrong happens. It has got to be openly said. If a society does not support the truth, See, our habit is that in Farsi they say maranja maranj. Maranja maranj means don't do anything which would hurt other people so that you may not be hurt. Or in English they say sitting on the fence. Neutral, neutral. See, you cannot remain neutral in the days of crisis when there is a problem. There has got to be some involvement. When there is na haq, someone has got to speak and we have got to support. When there is haq, then somebody has got to speak and we have got to support. I mean this passive spectatorship or what we finally call silent majority is sometimes killing us in all matters. And therefore someone has got to speak up and the rahmah will not come. Once injustice is being welcomed, when people can't distinguish between good and bad, when shaitan, when Allah is good, but shaitan is not very bad. When we try to compromise the situation, you see. When we welcome the munafiqeen. When we speak and talk and laugh with those who saw the codes of discord and dissent in the community. We become friendly to all. That means it is the last stage of hypocrisy that we can maintain in community. <laughs> And someone has got to speak even if it means cutting off his throat. That speech I'm going to make. I'm going to say. For in my life, 56 or 57 years, I've never cared for any prestige. I shall never care for that. If anybody cares to say, Salamun Alaikum, he may say, if he does not, it's okay. I don't take that to heart. But I say this. And I'm going to say so many things because that is the message of this Ramadan. God knows whether we will be here, I will be here next Ramadan or I will not be here. Life is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So many developments are going to take place very soon. You might not see me again. For that reason I'm telling you that I'm going to give you this parting message. Like it or not, Amr bil ma'roof wa nahyan bil munkar is so important. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.